Hello everybody and welcome to our January episode of the Queer Disrupt podcast. This is the Queer Disrupt co-convener, uh, Nick Choman, doing my usual shoehorning into people's lives and they're desperately trying to get rid of me. Um, I was going to say that's a joke, but it's not, I think. Um, <laughs> it's probably a, re- a real life scenario for most of us. But anyway, anyway. Today, um, we are looking at reconceptualizing the work of Rotini Fanny Coyote. Um, and we have our very own committee member, Adebayo Quadri Adekombi, um, in discussion with brilliant queer curator, 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 Dan Vo. Um, they look at the work of Nigerian photographer, Rotini Fanny Coyote, and how his work queries and challenges perceptions of gender, sex, and race. Uh, the question is asked, how can we view these works so a non-Western lens? And what does that mean for understanding and engaging with artwork? Before we start, there is a blog post that accompanies this podcast. And I really, really recommend you go on our website and have a look at that just before you listen. There's a really short introduction which sort of brilliantly frames the podcast. And it also includes all of the really incredible photos that I discussed. And they are incredible. Please do look. Um, go follow along with that if you get the chance. Um, and like I said, it really helps frame some of the conversation you're about to hear. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to ask you to listen to this really fascinating discussion um, that explores aspects of Yoruba culture, colonization, queering art, and it even asks at the end, is this queering the interview? Asking who's queering who? Ooh. Um but uh, yeah, I, just as a final note, this is possibly one of my favourite podcasts we've put out so far. So I really hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Queer Disrupt podcast. My name is Adebayo, and I will be guiding you on the journey of disruption today. I am a committee member at Queer Disrupt and a PhD student at Warwick Sociology. My research explores the intersectional politics of queer activism and feminism in Nigeria. I'm particularly interested in decentering Western paradigms from Africa. Today, I am joined by the amazing, amazing Dan Vo. Dan, could you please tell us a bit about yourself? I got two amazing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you deserve it. You're welcome. <laughs> a journey of disruption. I love it. That sounds so much fun. I'm looking forward to having a chat with you today, Adebo. So I'm Dan Vo, and I'm the project manager of the Queer Heritage and Collections Network. And I do LGBTIQA plus tours all across the country with different museums uh, and collections, including the Victoria and Albert Museum, which we'll be talking about a little bit for the work that we'll be talking about. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction. I told you, you deserved it. You deserved two awesomes. I'll stop it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So today, Dan and I will be um, looking through some of Rotomi Fanikaide's works together, and we'll be discussing what we can see and, you know, how we can interpret these artworks. I'm particularly interested in looking at these from um, these pieces from theoretical considerations of Yoruba existences that have sort of attempted to decenter Western paradigms from that. Um, Dan, do you have any particular strategies on how you're going to I guess, attack these pieces. For me, it's about what I see off the page, off the photograph, I suppose, because for me, I don't really have much of an academic background. It's, it's, you know, or an art history background. It's something that I'm, I'm accumulating now. But for me, it's about what I see, experience and feel when I first approach his works. And I suppose that's really exciting for me to, to speak with you today, because you're going to take me on a journey deeper than what is sort of on the surface. So for me, when I look at it, for example, it's about there's elements of interesting notions of religion and culture and colonialism and also uh, a touch of sensuality and eroticism in these images. But you're going to take us deeper. So that's that's going to be really exciting for me today as well. Well, I mean, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> So for those of us that don't know, the Yoruba people can be located primarily in Nigeria. Um, I'm Yoruba myself, and so was Rotimi Fani Kayode. So I kind of thought it was, appro- it was appropriate to see how this has sort of influenced his work and how his work can be read differently depending on where you exist. Um, even though we're both Yoruba, we could see these things differently based on, again, how we exist differently in the world. And also, I'm not attempting by no means to say what Fanny Kayode's intentions are with his pieces, but to sort of reconceptualize how we, the viewers, can see them. So essentially, 
disrupting them. And again, these images that we will be exploring today will be available in a blog post that I will be releasing with this podcast. So you can follow along with us as we dive in. So a brief history on Road to Me, Fanny Kayade. Fanny Kayade was a photographer born in Nigeria, and he moved to the UK at the age of 12 to escape the Biafra War. The Biafra was a civil war that happened in Nigeria um, towards the late 60s, the early 70s. Fanny Kayade died at a very, very young age of 34, which I actually thought was quite sad. I did not think he died that young. But his works have been featured in various prominent galleries and exhibitions, including most recently at the Barbican in the Masculinities Exhibition. Am, am I right about that, Dan? Absolutely, yeah. There's about six images that was there. And there was also a set of images that were used for the Gender Exhibition that was run by the Science Gallery as well. So that was uh, a really, really beautiful set of images that I got to see. I didn't get to see the Barbican one because of uh, lockdown, unfortunately. But that's some of the most recent displays of his work, I think, in, in the UK. Yeah, neither did I re- regarding the Barbican one. When I did realise it was on, it was already off. <laughs> so I could I didn't get a chance to see it, even though I really, really wanted to. But for those that don't know um, Rotomi Fanny Kayade, he is very well known for his ability to, let's put it this way, explore the bodies of men, essentially, quite well. I first came across the work via the v So there was an exhibition that was called The Body. And if I could just quickly describe that piece, because it was my first peering into the world of Fanny Kayade. For me, it was just this beautiful sort of golden image. The, the colours are so warm and, and the, the way that he depicts the body, I, I, I did look it up to just see how it sort of, for me, it registered you know, instantly. You kind of get a moment when you see a piece of art and you kind of go, oh, I think there's something here. The person who made this, there's a bit of a queer essence to this. I connect with this deeply. And so I, I looked it up and, uh, and it turns out that Rotimi Fanikoda was also considered to be one of the first Africans to portray gay identity in photography as well. And so I think that's, you know, it, it, it kind of comes through in the work as well. If you're new to to it. I think when you kind of look at that, I think there's elements that kind of give you a bit of a hint about some of the things that he was exploring. Some of it really high concept thinking, but a lot of it, I think we can sift it down to a level that is really approachable and that we can really just get a sense of what he's trying to portray to us as well. Mm. And kind of from looking into, into some of the works that you've done, I recognise that you interviewed one of his subjects recently. Could you tell us what that experience was like for you? Well, it was kind of remarkable. So Robert Taylor is a photographer that is in the collection of the V&A as well. So Robert's a, a photographer. He's got a really beautiful set of black and white images. And we went in to explore it and have a look. And then I later interviewed him. And it was during the interview that he revealed that that picture that I just described at the v and during in the Bodies exhibition, which is this very attractive man, I think, <laughs> who has a, a, a an offering of fruits in his lap. You know, there's uh, lemons and there's this sort of honey that sort of drips across his thigh. It turns out that was Robert. So he, he told me that there's a series of photos that I since have learnt about that he was the subject in all of those. So it was, it was thrilling. And I think I gasped out loud when I found out that that was him. So did I. So did I. I think <laughs> you, you kind of recognize halfway through the episode because I remember you don't really know that it's him until halfway through. And then he was like, oh, that's me. And I'm like, wait, 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 what? That was you? <laughs> I just, they are such a wonderful, you know, to hear Robert talk about Rotimi and the way that they collaborated together, I think it's just wonderful to hear that firsthand explanation of what it was like to work with him and, and the way that you could sort of see him spark and think. So yeah, just such a wonderful I think, you know, to get a degree of proximity to an artist like that, because he he died in 1989, I think, you know, that's, that's a fair way away. And so to get that proximity and to get a little bit more understanding about the period in which they created and to get an understanding of how they were really up against Thatcher's homophobic Britain, for example, I think bringing elements of the environment around them, that also kind of helps us understand the challenges that they were trying to overcome at the same time. I completely agree. And I think also just kind of the multiple identities that shaped their existences at the time. It's so interesting to kind of just see all of these different aspects. But yeah, so starting with masculinities, I was wondering if you could possibly tell me what you see in regards to Fanny Kayode's depictions of gender, sex and sexuality in his pieces. Yeah, I would just be interested to hear your thoughts on that. See, this is an interesting thing, which for me, it's the not being able to experience that exhibition, I think, uh, leaves a, a lot to be worked out because I don't know exactly what the curator was intending. So if we just viewed them separate from the rest of the exhibition and thought about the different depictions of masculinity, you know, there are bodies in play. And 
For me, when I think about, you know, the black bodies that it depicts as well, I know that Rotimi spent a lot of time in the US. He was at the Pratt Institute, you know, the iconic Pratt Institute. You know, if you were there in New York at the time, that was the pinnacle of, you know, photographers. You know, it was one of the best institutions. And he worked alongside Robert Maplethorpe a lot. And I'd like to think about the comparison between their works sometimes because, you know, they both inspired each other and the way that they show desire, masculinity. I find that there's almost like a, a an element of fetishization that's in Maplethorpe's work that isn't in Rotimi's work. It's And it's only when you kind of place them together that you kind of get that sense. But with Rotimi, there's, there's a sense that he, I almost feel that sometimes there's a, a placement of he's using the body to, to create a narrative that he's putting a bit of himself into as well. It's that idea of, you know, are you creating a bit of an autobiography in your work as well? And so I, that's what I try to think through with each of the photo- photographs. So the first one, for example, is a black body in profile. It's in a dark background and they're holding a set of scissors. And that is actually a really interesting one to start with because there's the threat of the scissors as well and the proximity to where it is, which is on the hip quite close to the groin. And suddenly it opens up a whole bunch of questions about what you think in terms of what Rotimi thinks about with sexuality and gender. And so what what does that kind of start with you for, for you, Adebayo, when you look at that? I see two things. So I think for one, I, the first thing I do see is kind of the use of naked bodies, but kind of the overuse of naked bodies in a sense. I think what that really does is it normalizes the sight of queer naked bodies, because I recognize the more I looked through Fanny Kaede's works, the more desensitized I was to the nakedness of the people in the, in the, in the, in the images. And I think what that also does is it also acts as a site of resistance as well. And kind of this rejection of normativity and the normative practices of respectability that is usually, you know, expected from black queer non-normative identities you know you're seen you're expected to kind of be um hidden to be in the closet all the time and not be not be seen but what Fanny Kaede kind of does with his use of naked bodies in this sense is not only is he showing us black queer bodies in their full form is showing us in their naked full forms and saying you know what you will see me for exactly who I am and how I am. I think yeah he's definitely making a political statement isn't he there's the sense that he is depicting something that he feels wasn't being depicted before. He is an African man. He's using a, a medium that he's picked up in Britain. And he's now saying, well, here are bodies that would be depicted the way that I might want to see them. For me, the first three sets, you know, you've got the scissors, you've got someone from behind with showing their open palms with a bowler hat. And then you've got a man squatting down with a large afro. And I think that these are a set that come together quite nicely. It's the next three that are part of this display that for me is interesting because it's starting to veer into a territory that I don't know as well. And I think that this is something that you can actually give us a little bit more insight into. Yes, definitely. But just before we go into that, I actually wanted to mention the one in the middle, the in masculinities, one with the afro. That's actually my favorite. I don't know why. I, th- I think it's the hair. It's just so beautiful. It also made it into a lot of the posters as well. So I think uh, it was, it is a very striking image. He does very, very striking images. I agree. It's so gorgeous to look at. But anyway, that being said, in a lot of these images, and the images I can see here anyway, the erotic nature for me is both non-existent and possibly unimportant. I think the way Indigenous cultures experience sex and sexuality and gender is very different from the Western conceptualizations of that. Especially, again, when you're considering this from a Yoruba perspective, that a Yoruba perspective that has decentered Western paradigms from that, right? I don't see this and immediately think sex and eroticism. And I think this is particularly apparent even with the bronze head 1987 which is the one right next to the one we were just talking about that i thought was beautiful yeah i think the concept of sex and sexuality and nakedness and eroticism that exists there i think is quite unimportant in my opinion but i would be very interested to see you know when you see it what do you think about it see i'm going to now overlay all the things that i think i expect an audience coming into the barbican might see so here is a bronze head of an icon, which we may presume to be a deity. It's on a plinth. And now pressed upon that head is buttocks. So someone is sitting onto it. And so this now, if you kind of just go to a generic audience, you might kind of think, oh, all right. So there's there's something sexy about this. There's something challenging about this, something that's considered to be that looks spiritual is being sat upon as well. And because it's, you know, the buttocks, you kind of go, well, is this a bit profane? Is this something that is that Rotimi Fanicode is trying to explore that idea of whether or not sex is considered to be moral, immoral? I think that's 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 what I might approach it with. 
openly. And I think all of those would be absolutely valid. And I think another aspect that people tend to read into Fanny Coyote's work, particularly this one, is just kind of the fact that, you know what, it's a man. We immediately gender it the moment we see it. So it's not just the person sitting on a deity's head. We see it as a man performing these acts. Now, before I go into like kind of what my thoughts are on this, I'm going to read a quote by Alex Hurst. So Alex Hurst was Fanny Coyote's partner and collaborator in actually quite a lot of things. And Alex Hurst says, so this is an unacceptable behavior, a memoir. Um, Hurst says, in bronze head, Rotimi is given birth to an Ife bronze. Ife, the cradle of an ancient Yoruba culture, is also his city of origin. The head, Uri, which for the Yoruba is the seat of the spirit, Orisha, represents a god. Symbolically, the artist is transforming his old culture into contemporary terms. Having understood that the old values no longer work, but still have power as archetypes. Also, he is presenting his rare end, a traditional affront to the powers that be. The image contains the idea of the head as a higher phallus, penetrating and fecundating the artist. Although a man, destined to penetrate the depths of the unconscious, here the artist is also feminine, receiver, who is fertilized by it, and thus able to bring forth a son of God. Now, what I think is very, very important for us to point out from this is kind of the first line, which says, in bronze head, Rotomi is given birth to an Ife bronze. What I think is very important is that what this actually does is it really opens up the ideas of motherhood being read into this work, as opposed to us seeing it the way we've always done in the context of sex and sexuality, but actually invoking the idea of motherhood in this. So in indigenous Yoruba cultures, again, ones that have decentered Western paradigms, we can sort of understand that the idea of motherhood was never gendered. It was never, there was never even an idea of sex attached to the concept of motherhood. Motherhood in itself was just kind of seen as this position that you were in society. You know, the gods and deities that we serve in Yoruba culture, you know, we're see, we, we see them as being co-created by mothers, especially when you consider how Oshun, for example, who is a god and deity in, in Yoruba culture, can be reconceptualized as the mother of them, as opposed to just a deity and a god in her own right. So mothers in that sense, the Iya, which is what we call the mother, is seen as this co-creator, right? And if you look at that perspective, motherhood is also a spiritual thing in a lot of um, Yoruba epistemologies, right? And especially if you look at the fact that, you know, we consider mothers as these people who, especially during labor, they are in this position where they are the bridge between our world and the other world, you know, the world of the unborn. And, you know, they exist in that two realms at childbirth, which is one of the reasons why, you know, on the day of labor, we call it ojoy kule, which is, um, you know, ikule abiyamo, that's labor. That is when the mother is usually on her knees, which is historically how Yoruba mothers had their children. You know, they had it on their knees. And when they go on their knees, they are essentially praying also during that labor. They are also in a, in a state of prayer. You know, they're having their uriki called, called onto them. And all of these practices are ways to kind of appease the gods and beg them and say, please help me on this journey that I'm going into, this journey of motherhood that I'm starting. Because, you know, you become a mother when you have a child, not because you're a female, not because you're a woman. You become a mother because you have been able to have a child. It was never, again, gendered. And this is usually depicted in arts as kind of a kneeling woman who, you know, according to art historian um, Abiodu, signifies kind of this reverence that mothers have to the gods to help them during childbirth. And I think if you look at this picture again, you can kind of see that's not too dissimilar to how um, Fanny Carade is posed in this picture. And I think looking at this picture as anatomically male, when again, there's absolutely nothing to signify this, it limits the possibilities of interpretation. And again, looking at it from a Yoruba perspective, we're able to open up those interpretations and look at it outside of just, you know, again, sex and sexuality, but invoke those ideas of motherhood. Mm. So for me, the question is, is that this might turn into a bigger conversation about colonialism as well. And the impact of that over time is if we were to take this image to Nigeria now, how might it be received today? And then if we kind of look back to Rotimi's time, what might have been the case well, I think for one, we have to recognize that, you know, Fanny Cayade's times, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and maybe 80s aren't that far off or that that different from our ones, especially when you look at it in the context of colonialism. You know, they're both products of the colonial project. And I think in that sense, you kind of have to understand how colonialism has kind of obfuscated our culture in a sense and kind of made, made it undecidable for us even as well. And I think a very good example of that is, you know, the way when they came into our cultures, they kind of read it and saw it based on their own paradigms and their own societies um, and how they operated, you know, um, without, again, kind of questioning and interrogating, maybe these people are just aren't like that. And maybe they just don't act that way. They just don't see things this way and the way we do. But, you know, because of the way they are in their positions in society and how they've always seen things, they read our societies the same way. And again, in the Yoruba culture, a very good example of that is a concept of gender. 
in the sense that looking into our indigenous knowledges, you can kind of see that the idea of gender does not necessarily exist in our paradigms. And our language is a very, very big indicator of that. We have no gender pronouns. We have no he, no she. We only have indicators of age, which kind of allows us to understand that age was actually a very big signifier of your position in society as opposed to gender, which again, all of these Western people kind of came into our societies and read that wrong and kind of reiterated that back to us. So we now don't understand ourselves outside of Western intervention. And I think that's also one of the reasons why it's very important and possible for us to look at Fanny Kaede's works outside of gender, sex and sexuality, because now we can look at this image and the first thing we see isn't a man sitting on a deity's head, but a person. And then the ideas of motherhood can start coming into that because we can see this outside of the gendered nature of it or the sexual nature of it, but instead as the picture that is being depicted to us, which actually goes back again to our indigenous art practices, which depicts, you know, mothers doing this, giving birth to potentially gods as well, but also just people in general and just motherhood enacting itself, essentially. Because, because again, like gender just wasn't something that necessarily existed in our society. It didn't exist up until that rather violent colonial contact when... Yep a binary system of Western understanding of gender and sexuality was imposed over the country. And I think mm-hmm. there's the legacy that remains is the fact that we still have laws in Nigeria that prohibit same-sex relationships, love, and acts of same-sex love and desire. So is that is that a, a, an interesting part where it's now coming together? You've got the imposed colonial law and now the fact that it applies across both genders. It, it is trying to be a catch-all, you know, we're going to prohibit all of this now. 100%. I think definitely we have to understand these homophobic laws did not exist in a vacuum for us, you know. And I think it's very clear and apparent as well for you to understand some of the laws and legislations that was important to these colonial forces when they came in. And part of them were homophobic laws. And even that is a signifier for how we used to operate and organize our societies before the advent of colonialism, which I think is so important also that we just see that, you know, for you to understand what he, what is homosexual, you absolutely have to understand the concept of gender and sex and sexuality. And again, if that's something that doesn't exist in a society, then the concept of homosexual or homosexuality doesn't particularly exist in that society. Because again, for you to understand what is homosexual, you have to understand what is the standard that, you know, homosexuality is deviating from, which again, you know, is heteronormativity and heterosex- uh, heterosexuality, mm-hmm. right? So it's kind of the idea that, you know, as a man, you shouldn't be with a woman because, you know, you've started, you, you've essentially established the concept of gender and sex. And you've also now attached the performances and all of the acts, you know, you've now placed them in these strict boxes and said, this is where you are in society. This is where you are in society. You can't be with this person. And I think, again, this just kind of shows how different these societies are from, again, Western conceptualizations and how Western conceptualizations can easily come in and really just disrupt that, you know? And I think, that, uh, yeah, just disrupt it. I know that we've got these six images here, but I think it might be nice to shift now slightly to kind of talk a bit more broadly about that idea of what Rotomi Fanny Curry is doing here in terms of images of faith and religion, because that might actually start to play into that bigger narrative now about how that received knowledge that he was given about his own faith, that has been interrupted by that colonial contact. So perhaps we could talk about some of the other images that you've collected here that tell us about that relationship that Rotimi had with faith and the way that he was portraying that and your own retelling of it now. Of course. Um, so one of the biggest ones I was actually looking at is Nothing to Lose Nine um, Bodies of Experience, which was created in 1989. And on here, you can kind of see this person in front of a mask and the mask is sort of rooted kind of um, standing above the person. And, you know, it's sort of like the person's bowing down in reverence to this, again, mask that's kind of been mounted up. And I looked at this and I sort of thought to go do some research in regards to what this mask possibly represents in a lot of Fanny Caraday's works. And, you know, the mask is something that, from my research, was supposed to signify issue. So, in regards to the significance of masks in African traditional art, um, Fanny Caraday had this to say, and I quote, In African traditional art, the mask does not represent a material reality. Rather, the artist strives to approach a spiritual reality in it through images suggested by human and animal forms. I think photography can aspire 
adhere to the same imaginative interpretations of life. My reality is not the same as that which is often presented to us in Western photographs. As an African working in a Western medium, I try to bring out the spiritual dimensions in my pictures so that concepts of reality become ambiguous and are open to reinterpretation. This requires what Yoruba priests and artists call a technique of ecstasy. So um, the technique of ecstasy can kind of be conceptualized as you know sort of going into a sort of um, ecstatic trance to communicate with the gods and i use the term ecstatic not kind of in the sense of you know delusion and you know this delirious behavior it's 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 quite spiritual and i think this kind of possibly just signifies a way for Fanny Kayade to, you know, communicate with the gods and kind of, this is sort of his way of infusing the gods in his work and serve as that bridge between him and the gods. So we can sort of conceptualize the mask as in that sense could be this, you know, point of intersection to achieve that. And, you know, you can communicate through the mask. And I think this would allow us to understand why the mask can be a standing for issue in um, Fanny Kayode's work and also consider how Fanny Kayode conceptualizes issue. So to kind of understand who issue is in, you know, Yoruba culture, we tend to see issue as, you know, this messenger and interpreter to the gods, kind of this someone that, that the carrier of sacrifices and, you know, someone that acts as that intersection between we and the gods. And again, I think this is very important for me to point out. There's a definition, like kind of not a definition, but a conceptualization of issue by Robert Ferris Thompson. Robert Ferris Thompson is an American historian who kind of specializes in African art and kind of African history in a sense. And I think I'm bringing up his definition just because I think it really shows the implications of how, you know, the West is able to read uh, societies differently. So he kind of sees issue very similarly, you know, as the interpreters to the gods, carrier of sacrifices, but he sees issue as the intersection between us and the gods and goddesses, right? And not necessarily an intersection between us and the gods, you know, it's specifically about the, between us and the gods and goddesses. So the gender binary is already been infused there. And I think it, it kind of shows again, how the effects of Western paradigms on our culture and our societies and how we conceptualize ourselves as well, because you'll notice Fanny Coyote also conceptualizes issue very similarly in that sense on in this binary terms. Again, this is a quote by Fanny Coyote in his exhibition of Abiku and he conceptualizes issue and I quote, issue presides here because we should not forget him. He is the trickster, the lord of the crossroads, sometimes changing the signposts to lead us astray. He is present, showing off his phallus one minute and crouching as though to give birth the next. It is perhaps through him that rebirth will occur. So first of all, issue in this place is explicitly male because, you know, Fanny Coyote has already gendered issue in the sense of, you know, calling him a him. So that's already been established. The gendered nature has been attached to issue. However, I think even in this sense, the gendered nature that's attached to issue is quite a fallacy to the idea of who issue is, especially seeing issue as this, you know, mediator. It's, it's quite reductive to, to who issue is. It kind of gives this extra role and identity to issue as this, you know, non-binary figure. And while this is not a lie, issue is not non-binary because they specifically weren't non-binary in a world that existed in the binary, if that makes sense. Were you able to follow that? I absolutely am, because I think for me, when you say that, it, it lines up with some of the thinking that I have, which is Rotimi's work is often challenging heteronormative, colonial and Christian oppression. And I, I feel that th- what you're saying is very much demonstrating how he, his thinking kind of allows us to all this use of the icon here um, helps explain that a little bit better. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's one of the reasons why this is rightfully a disruption of queerness, right? Because, you know, Fanny Kaede's work is already queer. We absolutely can't dispute that. But I think it's also important to ask what queerness is it? Whose perspectives of queerness is it prioritizing here? And I think a lot of it is quite Western. Because again, when you think about how issue can usually be conceptualized in Yoruba culture, especially with people that, you know, like with queer people, they use, they can sometimes use that as a symbol of queerness in Yoruba culture. But again, my dispute is the fact that even the way we conceptualize issue as queer isn't even queer enough because we can even go further as opposed to queering just issue, but queering Yoruba culture as a whole, right? Seeing issue as the fact that issue is not non-binary because they specifically weren't but non-binary in this world that, you know, kind of existed in a binary. Issue was non-binary because Yoruba itself as a language, as a people, as a culture is non-binary. So the idea of issue themselves being this mediator between the genders 
and this kind of, you know, per, um, person of oh, God or deity that can, you know, switch between the genders, I think is quite a fallacy. A mediator between we and the gods. Yes, I can take that. A carrier of sacrifices. Yes, let's do that. However, again, on gender terms, I reject that because I think it's, I think it can be quite a fallacy and it can be a, quite a, a wrongful conclusion, you know, because again, that already establishes that the Yoruba people are a gendered people in the first place, which wasn't necessarily the case. So what's going on with this particular image then? Because we've got this this icon that's slightly to the back of the image and then you've got the person who's in front of it and they are wearing what looks to me like what you'd see. It's sort of leather harness, a leather harness and they have actually got their face turned away from us and towards the, the waist of the icon. So what's what's happening here in this particular image, do you think? I actually think this really speaks to our position as Western situated people, right? You know, we see this black leather harness and, you know, to us, it looks erotic. And I think, yeah, it, it really just speaks to our position as Western situated people, because again, in the West, this is an erotic thing. And I think some of these items don't necessarily carry the same meaning everywhere in time and space. It's quite different, right? And we also have to establish the social construction of this leather harness that he's wearing as an object of sex and sexuality. And I think we have to understand that, again, if we're reading this outside of the Western conceptualizations of that, this could literally be anything. It could just be a belt. Um, and I think it doesn't always have to invoke sex. Yeah, And I think also it just kind of looks like the mask is just being respected. Um, You know, this position and this pose that this um, person has looks more like the mask is being respected and revered more than a, like a sexual act is being performed on it. You know, it looks like this person's kind of heading to that person, to this mask for some form of protection. And I think it's very similar, similar to how Fanny Kayade, you know, conceptualizes issue as well, right? Especially if we see issue as this queer icon, it's only natural that, you know, you would want to cling to that for protection. And also like, you know, we, we do see Fanny Kayade critique as Yoruba culture quite a bit. But one thing I have a problem with is, you know, the fact that his critique has never really separated from colonialism. And again, I completely understand Yoruba culture does not exist in a vacuum, right? So I can kind of understand why this would be his portrayal of that, you know, especially if, again, we see issue as this queer icon, we want to cling to that icon if we feel like that's the only thing we can cling to in our culture. And like I said, I get it, you know, Yoruba culture does not exist in a vacuum. We can understand, you know, that this is how he would see that based on, again, the object of colonialism and what it's caused. But I think his critique of his culture and his critique of colonialism are often quite parallel to each other. Again, as opposed to sort of this interrogation of how the two actually intersect, right? Your culture could be a result of colonialism. You know, and I think Fanny Kayode embodies that amalgamation of the Yoruba ways of thinking and the Western corruption of that. And he can serve as that bridge. And it, it's even evident in how people choose to read Bronze Head, um, 1987 is, you know, they see him as him defacing the God, disregarding the God. And again, you know, it's this way for him to express how he's so upset by his culture and has been hurt by it. But again, it's, asking, is it your culture that upset you or the way your culture has been obfuscated and changed with, you know, through colonialism that upset you? Because again, I think these are two separate things that we also have to completely acknowledge. Yeah. I mean, the comment that you make about him clinging onto the, the mask, if we move to the next image, that's very much the idea here as well. The mask has been removed from the, what holds it and is now in the hands of the sitter. And it's really interesting because for me, the sitter is also, uh, they've got their eyes closed. So we don't know where their gaze is, whether they would look out towards us or whether they, they'd look away from us. But it effectively, the sitter has got their eyes, uh, they've closed their eyes and their face would be kind of looking slightly down and away as well. But their head is garlanded by what looks to be a, a crown of flowers. You've got some uh, beautiful red and yellow textures, as well as some uh, green leaves that poke through as well. So for me here, uh, they've actually got the, the mask as well, and they've tilted it almost in the in similar, very similar position to where the way they've tilted their head. And so there's a slight echo there with the mask also slightly downward and away. I find this really a breathtaking image. And I believe it's one of the ones that was actually on display in the gender exhibition as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the picture is so beautiful and the pieces on his head is so fascinating to me. But again, I see this and I don't really attach any sexual meanings to it. Like, I think if you look at this image, it looks like the mask is just being taken off or possibly about to be worn. And I think this kind of goes back to, you know, Fanny Kaide trying to tap into his culture, you know, trying to communicate with the gods. Again, going back to this technique of ecstasy, you know, going into this ecstatic trance to communicate with the gods. And, you know, I think it's it's very interesting to think that Ishu would, you know, Ishu would usually be that mediator. Ishu would be that person or that 
that God, sorry, that would bridge that gap, serve as that bridge between, again, us and the gods when you do want to have that communication. So if you kind of look at this mask as a representation of issue, it would not be very odd that, you know, Fanny Kayode would want mm-hmm. to, or that the, that the model would want to put it on um, to achieve that. And, you know, as a form of ritual. And even with like, you know, what he has on his head, which again, looks very, very beautiful. I mean, I can't really link that back to any Yoruba cultural practices per se, but again, it's, it's beautiful to look at. Mm. I mean, it's gorgeous. So there's something quite touching about this image. And there was another image that was displayed next to it in the gender exhibition as well. These were some of the last works that Rotimi created. And he died for us quite suddenly. We've acknowledged that he died at 34 and he died of HIV AIDS, uh, of uh, an illness related to that. And so these are some of the last things that he's thinking about in his life as well. And I, I wonder if there's sort of a, a veracity to the, what he's creating and the number of striking images that he makes. And, you know, his body of work is about seven years. And I often kind of think, you know, we're looking at things like the leather harness, for example. Well, if he was to do it today with the accessibility of so many more materials to him, would he have used something different? You know, what what might he have used? So maybe that was a reflection of what was available to him at the time. You know, he's such a well-respected artist. Now he'd have so much more resources to pull. What would he create now to tell us these stories? But here we are with what is the last set of works that he creates. And this for me is probably one of the most, I, I absolutely adore this one as well. You've got a person who again has their hair garlanded. This one is predominantly red. There's The, the leaves kind of cover their face, start to cover their forehead. Uh, and they've actually completed the job by placing their hands over their eyes. And there's a, a fruit that's been sort of held in their mouth as well. So you can't see their mouth either. And for me, it's there's something incredibly captivating about this. It just you're just so deeply drawn into this piece of work, and to think that these are some of the last things that he was creating is quite sad. Yeah, it really is. I completely agree, and I think it kind of also speaks to you know understanding those spiritual aspects that can be kind of you know invoked here. You know, if we go back to the whole idea of you know techniques of ecstasy and communicating with the gods, speaking to them, understanding that these were some of his last works, even like by himself, he he understood that you know, could have motivated some of these and charged the direction that, you know, a lot of his works went in. And, you know, that I also find this picture very, very interesting. But again, I can't really make much connections from a Yoruba perspective with these. But as an image in the collection that it sits in, I think we can definitely see these, these as, you know, kind of rituals and the ideas of, again, techniques of ecstasy being thought about here. So for me, these two images, I believe, are part of that Nothing to Lose series. And that means that it brings us right back full loop to my first experience of Rotimi Fanny It is that Nothing to Lose number 12, and that was on display at the VNA. And, you know, this is Robert Taylor. And I would love to see that. Uh, I'd love to understand for you, you know, this idea. I've always thought of these fruit that is being placed into the images. There's an element of an offering being made. And and to come back to that final, uh, um, well, the first image and our final image, in a way, the honey that oozes out of that offering of fruit. I'd love to kind of get to uh, get your thoughts on what you see. Of, of course. Uh, and I think this is possibly something that we've kind of touched on as well. You know, looking at issue as this intersection between us and the gods and, you know, the messenger and this, you know, collector of sacrifices. So, so you know, when we make sacrifices, we can imagine that issue delivers them, you know, we'd be going through issue. And I think it would make sense why Ishu would be, you know, represented in these images. You know, he's the one doing the delivery. But, you know, we also see Ishu as this queer figure because, you know, that's really one of our only contemporary claim to queerness, you know, like we've already established. So, yeah. It makes sense that he would have these fruits and things that, you know, look like sacrifices to God. And, you know, especially if we're contextualizing these in 1989, which is the year he died and created these pieces, you know, we can see these in the frame of when he died and, you know, link them back to the fact that these are his last pieces and are, you know, purposefully placed as a means to sort of prepare himself, you know, and issue being ready to, you know, take him on that journey of, you know, rebirth, so to say. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, there was one set of work that was released posthumously as well. And that uh, that is very much the series that we were uh, talking about in the interview with Robert Taylor as well, which is the one with the, the golden phallus. But to think of this as the last contact that he had and was able to to, to showcase to people, I think is, is, yeah, it is very touching. And to be able to now understand some of those things that were swirling around in his mind, which is not something that I have as much of an understanding because I can look to his work 
I can relate to his work as a queer man, as a gay man, and kind of go, okay, there are elements there that I kind of get and understand, and that touches me. But for Rotimi, there was always sort of three categories of uh, of of separation from him, or ways in which he considered himself to be an outsider. He sort of said that it was to do with his sexuality, but it was also to do with the fact that he felt displaced because of his geographical and cultural displacement from his roots. You know, he he grew up in Brighton and then he went off to New York. And then the final element was just the way that he was thinking about his own faith and what he thought his parents expected of him as well, whether he was going to go off and be a professional married man. Well, no, he ended up being a photographer and exploring these things. And and boy, am I glad that he did do that because these, these are things that reach out at me from decades ago, but I still look at and connect with. And now you've given me this additional layer that helps me understand the the way in which Rotimi was trying to communicate to us things that weren't just immediate of his time. It wasn't just Thatcher's Britain. It wasn't just what he was experiencing at the time, but it goes back decades and decades and generations and generations before him as well. And going right back to an understanding that we have to be able to overcome the hurdle that was placed, the massive hurdle that was in place by colonial contact to be able to even scratch the surface. 100%. And I'm like, you know, what this hopefully does is kind of helps us find other ways to see people's work outside of the way we would traditionally conceptualize them, you know, and not only does this kind of help us understand them better, but also helps us understand where they're coming from better as well. You know, Fanny Caraday was very much a, again, Western situated artist, you know, of course, he's of African origin, but a lot of his audience were Western. And I think they always saw that from their Western perspective, and you know, which means they immediately saw sex and sexuality, you know, they immediately saw leather straps, they, you know, they see a butt on a head, on a, ma- on, on a mask and, you know, think about sex and penetration and, you know, just invoking sex and sexuality without understanding, again, the cultural dimensions that could exist there as well. And, you know, and even for Fanny Kayade, like, you know, whether he recognized it or not, a lot of those indigenous practices are, are embedded into his memory and cultural practices. Like, Fanny Kayade was someone, again, who came from this family that worshipped these Orishas. So they're less farther removed from these indigenous practices than, you know, some of us who are, like, Christians now, for example, you know, they're more in touch with those indigenous practices. And even though some of these cult indigenous practices have been, have been warped, you know, through colonialism, that there's a lot of memory that's embedded there, you know, and I think it's evident now, even like that, you know, even though Fanny Coyote is gone, um, he can't interpret his work for us anymore. But when we see them, what we can do is see some of his work and see Yoruba indigenous practices there because whether he knew it or not, they're embedded there based on, again, the memory that's inherent to him Mm. as a Yoruba man. Mm. I love that. That's a very, very wonderful summary. I'm going to say that we've talked about some of the amazing collections that he's been displayed at. I think one of the most important legacies that he's left behind for us, apart from his fantastic body of work, is the fact that he was the founder and first chairman of Autograph ABP, which is what was formerly originally first founded by him as the Association of Black Photographers. And it's black in the sense of political blackness, which is very much something that in his time in the 80s, political blackness was a very important concept because it wasn't just uh, black people, it was people of color as well, standing alongside and supporting and, and other people supporting it as well. So being able to say that I'm politically black was really, really important. And to be able to have an organization to leave behind such an influential organization. You know, these these photographs are on display because it was loaned from Autograph, for example. But beyond that, there's so many amazing photographers, contemporary photographers today that they continue to support as well. And, you know, to be able to support living artists now and be able to explore the narrative now as to what we're going through. And I, I tell you what, some of the things we've talked about still resonate so strongly with what's going on now. You know, there's still a lot to be disassembled, decolonized in our collection as well. I think that, you know, it is one of the most amazing things that he's left behind. And I really do strongly urge you, if you're listening to please have a look at Autograph and the amazing photographers that they, they work with and the amazing different concepts that are explored from, you know, one point here, Rotimi Fanny Cody, it, it expands to so many different ideas that you can pick up and relate to. Yeah, definitely. And I think what you have as well is, you know, a lot of artists, not even like only photographers, but, and, you know, kind of the legacy of autograph, which is 
absolutely phenomenal. But, you know, a lot of these indigenous knowledges are beginning to be, you know, disseminated in artistic spaces. And I think that's something that we spoke about earlier as well with um, Tony or Gio de Tola's um, A Countervailing Theory, um, which is running at the Barbican at the moment of recording. I'm not sure if it would still be, if it would still be on when this is released, but I know it's there till January. But <laughs> it, it's such an amazing exhibition that, you know, sort of interrogates and subverts a lot of these Western normative practices, you know, um, heteronormativity, capitalism, sexism, and it tackles them all simultaneously, which I think is just amazing. And it just really goes to show the importance of not just taking an art piece at face value, but, you know, understanding the artist, where they're from, the motivations, and, you know, kind of what cultural understandings are embedded in their works as well. And the remarkable thing for me as well is when you look at a photographer's work, it is for that split second in which they captured it, you're now given that intimate seating where you are centered in that particular photographer's view. It is their perspective. This is what they have, you know, seen themselves and you are right there in their mind. And so that idea of, you know, uh, whether Rotimi was an outsider or not, well, it doesn't matter because for that moment, when you're looking at this picture through his eyes, he is the only center that you've got. Yes. Which I think is amazing. Like he's so talented, you know, it's been such a great and beautiful experience sort of researching his work for this podcast and, you know, sort of coming across a lot of the background things that he was, you know, experiencing and that, you know, sort of underlaid his work and influenced his work. I think it's just, it's great to be in the shadows of a legacy of someone like that. You know, I, I don't know. I, well, I, I suppose it's another way to put it is we always stand on the shoulders of giants, don't we? So, you know, shoulder- what a giant to stand upon. Shoulders. That's what I meant to say. I don't know. Shadow. What the hell? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Well, Anna, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed seeing so much more deeply into the work of Rotimi Fernikiridi. Yeah, and thank you for joining me on this and doing this with me. And I think halfway through the podcast, you kind of became the host, and I became the guest. <laughs> But, but you know what? That's I fine. Think... It's fine. I think, you know, it kind of shows the crossroads, the intersection, the issue is, you know, we are at the crossroads of guest <laughs> and host. You know, there's no binary here. This has been secular and negotiable at every point. So, you know, that's good. It's cool. <laughs> Definitely. I think we walked this journey together. So, yeah, we're at the crossroads together. <laughs> I agree. Well, you know, thank you so much for joining me um, today, Dan. I had such a great time sort of discussing these things with you. So yeah, no, thank you for joining me. I had fun. Absolutely the same. Thank you so much, Adebo. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And thank you for listening to the Queer Disrupt podcast. And where can they find you, Dan, if they'd like to be in touch with you? I'm all over social media as at Dan Nuvo. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and that's, you know, at dannuvo.co.uk is my website as well. So I look forward to hearing from you. Amazing, amazing. And and do you have anything you'd like to plug? (laughs) Well, you know, uh, if you're interested in what is happening around the world in terms of queer rights, uh, there is a podcast called Give Out. Uh, It is a fundraising organization based in Britain, but it is about directly funding people on the ground in the countries in which they are trying to change colonial laws. So they are trying to change the laws that are left over. uh, And it is, uh, you know, I I host it and I I love talking to the different people because we go all around the world and we can see how it is possible through individuals to change an entire narrative. So I, you know, there's so many countries in the world where it's still illegal to be homosexual. And one by one, we're trying to change that. And not just that, we're also tackling homophobia, transphobia, biphobia as well. But, you know, I, I'd love to, to get your ears on that and support that. And uh, it's it's such a, a great team. And I really encourage you to have a listen, because I think you'll probably enjoy some of the crossover talk that we might have. That's amazing. And thank you for sharing that. I think it's, it's actually very funny. I was going to plug something very similar, but specifically in the Nigerian context. Um, it's a documentary called Defiance. It's available on YouTube. It explores kind of queer existences in Nigeria. So, you know, it explores a lot of the homophobic laws, the discrimination that queer people experience, and just kind of dives into how queer people are mobilizing despite being, you know, criminalized by the state. Um, yeah, it's called Defiance. It's directed by Harry Itier. Um, it's on the Rustin Times YouTube channel. It's free of charge to watch as well. So you can just find it on there. But yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. Like, especially, you know, considering the similarities, I, I just kind of heard you say that and I was like, Oh my goodness, it's like Defiance, you know, Great minds, Dan. Great minds think alike, you know. (laughs) Synergy. (laughs) Right? (laughs) But yeah, no, thank you again, Dan, for joining me. Thank you to the listeners as well. Thank you for listening to the Queer Disrupt podcast. I have been Adebayo. Thank you for joining me on the journey of disruption. You can find me on all social media platforms at AdebayoQA. And remember to exist to resist. Catch you later. Thank you for listening to this month's Queer Disrupt podcast. 
For more podcasts, check out our Spotify, Spreaker and Apple Music account. We also have a YouTube account at Queer Disrupt, so please like and subscribe there. We have Twitter and Facebook, both at Queer Disrupt, so please give us a follow. And finally, our website is QueerDisrupt.com, where you can stay up to date on all of our upcoming events and see what else we have to offer. Thanks again and catch you next time.